For most Americans, when they talk about wanting welfare reform, what they're talking about is three groups. Those who are uh, able but not willing. Those who are able but don't know how. And those who are truly challenged. People with severe disabilities. Now I think for most Americans, you can draw a very sharp line right here. And you can say, for those who are able but don't know how, we're going to massively invest in helping them get across the line. Most of that investment is spiritual. This is where we'll talk about later on uh, when we get to this section of the course. Marvin Olasky's great work, The Tragedy of American Compassion. For folks who are able but genuinely not willing, this is what the Victorians called the undeserving poor. Uh, in, in the 19th century in America, if you were homeless, you could get lunch but in order, or a meal. But in order to get a meal, you had to chop wood. You chopped wood both for yourself and for a widow. That both gave you dignity and it proved that you were willing. If you weren't willing, they would resolutely refuse to give you food. And they'd say, no, we're not going to give you food. Because they had a profound sense that to give people who were not willing was to subsidize their self-destruction. So think of this as subsidized self-destruction. And in fact, I had a man the other day, and we'll talk about this more later, who, who said when we, he had a friend, he, he was at, at a press conference, he had a friend who, was, who got his first supplemental security income check just at Christmas and was able to shift from drinking cheap wine to bourbon and had a heart attack on the second bottle. He said, you and the government killed him. He said, let me tell you, let me, he said, let me tell you, you should not give money to people who are not able to govern their own lives because they destroy themselves. This group, we want to reach out and say, here's how you work, here's how you learn. Because they're really willing to, but they've, they've had no background, no cultural framework. They've grown up in a culture of poverty and violence with, where they literally don't know what to do. But they're willing to do it if, if somehow it's not 200 families to one caseworker, it is one to one or one to two, and we're helping them learn these new habits. This is, this is actually very solvable. But this one's different. Here what you want to do, I think, is you want to invest in technology, in rehabilitation, and in maximizing opportunities. And you want to say, and this is almost case by case, you want to say to somebody who's going to spend their whole life in a wheelchair, or somebody who's born blind, or somebody who has a particular problem of great difficulty. How do we maximize your chance to pursue happiness? And I believe most Americans would in fact want to increase the resources applied here because all of us recognize that this is through no fault of their own and that this could happen to any of us. Any of us could have a child that has a problem. Any of us could have a relative. Any of us could have, you know, the, the Charles Krauthammer effect of diving into a swimming pool and breaking your neck or being in a car wreck. So here I think we should actually increase resources but in a very focused, very spirit of invention and discovery kind of model. Yeah. There are some very great creative people who come out of this background. Now, last example is telecommuting. That you literally will see, I think, a decline in rush hour traffic in the 21st century because people just stay at home and work. You'll see actually a substantial drop in the number of people who go to work. Not that they're not working. It's just that they get up and they, they go into their office, which is in their house, or they go into a room in the basement, or they go across the street. But it's a totally different model. And we have not thought very much, if you had to spend the next billion dollars on highways or on telecommuting, what should be better? And in fact, the IRS has adopted exactly the wrong rule because it has made it harder to have a home office, not easier. Okay? But you can't file your tax return electronically. <laughs> right. Well, uh, 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 you can, but I met with them the other day, and it's still not as easy as it should be. And actually, we ought to let you have half the savings. Sure. If we said, if you'll file electronically, it'll be $20 less, take $20 off the bottom, you'd have 90% of the country filing electronically within five years. Today, there's no value, yet you're saving the government a lot of money, and it's more accurate according to the government. All right. 
as we look at the spirit of invention and discovery, remember we want, we want to think through applying what are, what's our vision of getting there, what are our strategies for getting the culture to move in that direction, what are the projects we want to use, and what are the tactics we want to use. Now as you go through that planning, remember that the next phase then is you think you got it a break, you've gotten the breakthrough, you go out and you do what we're going to do with disabilities, you start listening to people who are in the situation. You try to learn from them, so they're telling you about their world. If you listen to them and learn from them, you can begin to help them. And in a rational, healthy society, people who know that you'll listen to them, learn from them, and help them want you to lead them. I believe if we can apply, if we can begin to shift the entire culture into a spirit of invention and discovery, we'll be shocked how big the impact will be. We'll be shocked how much we invent, how much we discover, how much more dynamic we are, and how much progress we've made by about 2020. And so it has to be a culture-wide basic shift in attitude and in approach. Now next week we're going to pick up Pillar 5, quality, customer orientation, teamwork, continuous improvement, systems analysis, and the spirit of Edwards Deming, the man who taught the Japanese the concept of quality. I think you'll find it very useful. Next week's reading, uh, Kenneth Develine and J. Daniel Robertson, Deming's Profound Changes, Chapter 3. And this is all being given out to you here. Uh, Lloyd Dobbins and Claire Crawford Mason, Thinking About Quality, Chapter 3, and Peter Senge's Building Learning Organizations from the Journal for Quality and Participation, March 1992.